Could you introduce, if to someone who may not be familiar, which most people will be, but for the sake of it, I ask everyone this. Could you introduce yourself and say who, it, what it is that you are most famous for? Okay. Hi, I'm Hope Holiday, and uh, <clears throat> I'm an actress and a producer, and uh, I guess I'm most well known for a movie called The Apartment with Jack Lemmon and Shirley MacLaine. It was probably Billy Wilder's best apart, best movie. He won more Academy Awards than anybody in years. He won a lot of Academy Awards for it, for everything. He died a happy man. <laughs> what can I say? Could you tell me what your earliest memories of film and television are, if you remember? The Milton Berle, uh, I don't know what the show was called, but I was very young when they did it. And uh, we used to watch it every week, my family, my mother, my father, myself, my sister. Uh, it was called The Milton Berle Show. It was on NBC, and we lived in New York at the time. We just loved it. It was very funny. He was a funny man, Did to you... a point. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to ask, because I know you started very early uh, your career at a very young age. Was that something that you had your heart set on at a young age, or was that something that you sort of fell into no it's, it wasn't something i had my heart set on it was something my mother and father pushed me into my father was a producer in new york uh he had a theater called the capitol theater and they had uh, stage shows and they had all the big bands and everything and i was a kid then and uh, my sister had a beautiful singing voice she was a a coloratura soprano she had a gorgeous voice i didn't as you can tell by my voice now, it's all crackly and everything. But um, her voice was wonderful, and she was beautiful. I wasn't. I was cute. I was cute, and I had personality and stuff. But I didn't really want to be in the business. But my father kept saying, sing Hopi, sing Hopi. And I would sing. I'd sing these crazy songs, and I'd sing loud. I had a big, brassy voice. And he said, I'm going to try and help you get into the business. The business. At 13 years old, he wanted me to be in the business. So I got into the business. I started studying ballet, tap, modern jazz, and uh, I took singing lessons. I took acting classes. Uh, and I took elocution, which I hated because I had this terrible Brooklyn accent. I probably still have it. I'm sure I do. But anyway, I was trying to get rid of it. And uh, my father had a show called The Hearn's Kitty Hour. Actually, it was before I was 13 because it was I was on The Hearn's Kitty Hour. And um, I, wanted, I was on it every Saturday afternoon. I sang my little songs. And uh, then I started growing. And then I got into, oh, oh I became an apprentice in Summerstock when I was 15 at the Ogunquit Playhouse in New York, in Maine. And uh, I hated it. I hated it. I had, I every night, I, my job was to clean the flies and all the dirt off the punch and make new punch. I had to make fresh punch. So what I did is I just cleaned the flies off and I cleaned all the dirt and the dust and everything off and I mixed it up and then they brought it out on stage and people drank it. I let them drink it for about three or four days and then I changed the water. It was terrible. <laughs> I was kind of a naughty kid. I was naughty in every show that I was in. I was always in trouble. Did you ever get yelled at for it or caught or, costed for, or uh, chastised for it? No, I got fired. I got fired. I got fired from, well, I was in the show Little Abner for a year and a half. I understudied Mammy Oakham, and I was a, a singer-dancer in it. And I used to get so bored for a year and a half doing the same thing every day and on Wednesdays and Saturdays, twice a day, and then understudy rehearsals. And I don't know if I can say this, but... I was doing what we called um, the pregnant run across, walk across, and I was going up to Washington with uh, a couple of other girls to see our newly beautified husbands, and we spoke with these phony 
uh, southern accents. And I was bored. And we bump into Mary and Sam, who was um, Stubby K and Edie Adams, who was uh, Daisy May. And he says, hey, where are you gals going? Well, I spoke in a Jewish accent. <laughs> you don't know what happened. He said, where are you gals going? I, you wouldn't believe, we're going to Washington to pick up our newly beautified husband. I, what a wonderful thing it is. And I happened to look into the wings, and I saw the stage manager there, and he was shaking his fist at me. And Stubby K's eyes were open wide, and his mouth was hanging open, and Edie Adams was shaking. And the girls, the two girls that were with me that were going up to Washington to see the newly beautified husband, started to giggle and laugh. Well, I didn't know what to do, so I turned in the other direction, and the other stage manager was on the other side of the uh, on the other side of the stage. I got so scared, I jumped into the orchestra pit. I and after I climbed out of the other side, I ran up the aisle in my little short little costume, ran out of the theater, got in a cab, and I went home. I lived in New York on 69th Street in Central Park West, and I go up to the apartment. I ring the bell. And my mom answers the door, and she says, Hopi? I said, what, Mom? She said, uh, the theater just called. You're fired. I said, oh? She said, yes, you're fired. What did you do this time? And I told her, she said, how could you do that? That's terrible. It's a terrible thing to do. But the funny thing is, they were so nice to me. The show was going to close in like four weeks anyway. It didn't make any difference, really. And I was in it for a year and a half. Then they then they called me and they asked me if I would like to do the national company of uh, Little Abner and play Mammy Yoakum. I said, no, I hate the part. I hate it. I don't ever want to see it or play it. Thank you anyway. Then about another week, I got a call from Paramount Pictures. My mother said, Paramount Pictures are on the phone from the New York office. And I spoke to some man. He said, would you like to be in the movie? I said, gee, I'd love to. He said, okay, $300 a week and a one-week guarantee, and you pay your own way out. And I did it. And I was in the movie. I danced and sang, and I did the stuff that I did in the show. I had a lot of dialogue. And uh, I was featured in a song called Put Them Back the Way They Was. And it was very, it was a cute song, very cute. I was going to say, was, was it directed by the same director who did the musical, uh, or was it a different director? No, it was a different uh, different director. The producer directed the movie, Norm, uh, Nor, uh, Mel Frank. It was Mel Frank and Norman Panama. They produced the, they produced the Broadway show, and they wrote it. And uh, they wanted me in it because they liked me. They didn't know what I did when I got fired. They didn't know I even got fired. Anyway, they hired me for the movie. I came out in the middle of May, and I went back in August. And when I went back, my mother said, Hopi, why don't you go back to California? Maybe you'll get a part in the picture. And I thought, sure, sure, I'll never get a part. So then I called my friend out here, and I said, Dickie, I'm coming out. Do you have a place for me to stay? He said, sure. So he found me a little apartment in West Hollywood, and uh, I moved in there. I had a roommate. I moved in, and first thing, I get an agent, and uh, the agent took me to meet Billy Wilder. What was his, What was your agent's name, by the way? Just give him some credit. Uh, well, I had two of his mother, Lillian Small, and Edgar Small. Lillian and Edgar Small. And uh, they had mostly women. Their clients were mostly women. They had Stella Stevens and uh, Tina Louise and people like that. They had some pretty good clients. Anyway, I went in. I read for him. He said, you know, uh, why don't you read for the part of Margie McDougal? I think you'd be right for that. She's a hooker from Brooklyn. I said, oh, okay. I'd love to. So I did. And he said, I want Jack Lemon to read with you. He said, have you got some time? Do you have an hour and a half or so? I said, yes. So he called Jack up. He said, come over here. I found the right person. I found the right actress 
for Margie McDougal. He said, you'll love her. So he came over, and we talked, and I was telling jokes. I don't know what I was talking about. I was so nervous. Anyway, they said what I read. He said, take the script, go into my other room. He had like a suite of offices at the Goldwyn Studios. And he said, uh, read your part. It starts on page whatever, 72. So I went in. I couldn't even read it. I was just sitting there in a chair, nervous, couldn't read. So he said, are you ready now? I said, sure. I came out and I read in this, you know, funny Brooklyn accent. And he then Jack read with me. And after he read with me, he said, she's great. He said, let's hire her. So they did. And that was the beginning of my career. And I did a lot of good movies after that. And then a lot of schlocky movies, too. I have a couple of television shows you did. I believe they were all with Paramount. I was wondering if maybe I could list them if you just have a quick thought on some of them, if you remember yeah. any experience. Do you remember doing Have Gun, Will Travel? Oh, yes, of course. I just got a very I, – I just – I put it on my page on Facebook, and I said, this is for you. It was a picture of me with Paladin with his arm around me where I get shot, and he's trying to save my life. And – uh I said, Dick Donner, Richard Donner, this is for you. You directed the film. And I never thinking I'd hear from him. Next thing that night, he answered my uh, my little message that I put on. He said, you were great in it. And he said, we had a ball. And he said, and then there was Richard Ney, who was a gorgeous looking man. I think he was once married to Greer Garson, who nobody will ever remember or know. But she was a big star years ago. And uh, he's my boyfriend, and he ends up saving my life. And there's a scene where after he saves my life, he smiles kind of at the camera. And then he bends over me, and you just see the back of his head. And what he did is he kissed me, and he stuck his tongue in my mouth. And I almost spit all over the place. It was terrible. <laughs> I don't know why he did that. It was horrible. But then we became friends after that. We became like buddies. And every time I had a party, he'd come and show up at 3 o'clock in the morning in a pinstripe suit, all dressed. Everybody else was in jeans. And he came like, uh, I don't know what, but he, he, looked, he looked pretty cute. So then that was the end of that. And that was the end of my friendship with him. And uh, or whatever you want to call it, and that was it. Then I went on to other things the... and other boyfriends. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Sort of. You did the bo- the Bob Cummings show. Yes, I did. What was it like and working with Mr. Cummings? He was a rat. <laughs> he really was. He said, "Your hair is too light." He said. They'll have to. They'll have to do something with the camera. He said, "Is I'm going to look old," meaning he was going to look old because of the lights. I don't know. It had to do with the lighting. He said, "Can't you make your hair darker?" I said, "No. I like it the way it is." So he said, "Oh," and he was a problem after that. It was hard working with him. He didn't know that I'd worked with him before, when I was very, very young. I did a show for NBC for um, Max Liebman called Best Foot Forward. He had the lead in it with Marilyn Maxwell. And then there were a bunch of kids in it. And we were the kids in, in the school at a prom. And Marilyn Maxwell was a star, big movie star. And we and we sneaked her into the, uh, into the party, into the uh, prom or whatever it was. It was just fun. And, uh, but he didn't remember that, thank God. Did you, well, what, do you remember what part you played in the Bob Cummings show? I, what was her name? I forgot what her name was. But I did that show. This is, this is kind of interesting. I did that show and I did the Phil, the new Phil Silver show. Mm-hmm. And it was the same show. It was a takeoff on my, it was called My Fair Letty. I played Letty. A takeoff on My Fair Lady, only she had a Brooklyn accent. You know, she had that awful New York accent talking like this. Maybe I still talk like that. I probably do. 
<laughs> I don't hear it. Anyway, uh, after that, I did um, I did uh, the Phil Silver show, which actually was the same show. Not, you know, not the same script, the same dialogue or anything, but the same idea where I'm like uh, the dumb idiot, the dumb blonde, and he's going to teach me how to talk and how to behave and teach me manners. I mean, Phil Silvers was the right person to teach me manners. He had none. <laughs> what can I say? Anyway, I did that show, and they were both the same show. I played Mildred Flitterman in that. I always had these awful names. You did the Jack Benny show? Yes, I played his girlfriend, Zelda. And the, the new Jack, Jack Benny show, it wasn't the early one that he did years ago. Yeah, this was years ago, too. This was in the 60s, but it wasn't the original Jack Benny show. We did it at Universal, and I played uh, his boss's maid. And uh, uh, we go to the Rose Bowl. It's called the Rose Bowl. And uh, it was New Year's Eve, and we stand all night in line, and he's got this big uh, raccoon coat on and a hat with a raccoon tail hanging down. And I was dressed in some jazzy outfit. Actually, this you're going to think I'm terrible when I tell you this, but I was better than Jack Benny in the show. Something happened to him. I don't know. It's like he died. Inside. Yeah, it, it, he just... He didn't make it, and I was funny in the show, and he wasn't. He just wasn't, and he'd say things to me. He never rehearsed. He just came in the day of the show. He would say things like, um, listen, you're not to say your next line until I put my hand on my hip and I turn my head to the side and roll my eyes. I said, oh, why? He said, because that's when I get my laugh. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, it upset me. It just upset me. But I went to see it recently. I looked at it over at uh, UCLA in the library. They have a, the biggest collection of old movies and stuff like that and old TV shows. So I looked at several of the things that I did. I looked at a show with Milton Berle called The Candidate that was on NBC. I played his girl Friday. And I knew him. Let's see, I've known Milton Berle since I was a kid. He gave me my sweet 16th birthday party in New York. Then when we were rehearsing the show, then this is years later, now we're rehearsing the show and we're going to shoot. They're setting it up and I'm in his dressing room and he says to me, did I ever go to bed with you? I said, no, you did not. You were a friend of my father's. How dare you? And he didn't use the word go to bed. He used another word that started with F. Mm -hmm. It was not nice. So I've had a lot of crazy experiences in my life. What can I say? I'm curious what it was like. What Do you remember working with Bob Hope? Uh, uh, Bob Hope didn't work with us. Okay. He didn't work with us. He produced the show. He didn't work with us. Okay. It was Milton Berle that I played opposite, who was common, What was very it? common. Uh, you you obviously told that story, but professionally working with him, what was he like? Or was he like that Once on set we as well? Got on the, no, no, no. He was very professional on the set, and he could have been. It, it would have been a good part for some actor to play, but he was the wrong person for that part. He did the best he could, but he wasn't great in it. But he was professional. We had. Uh, Dina Merrill on it. We had Ruth Roman, uh, an actor by the name of Bob Weber. He was a very good actor. He died a long time ago. Uh, we had some very good character actors on the show. Actually, it was a good show. It was about the man that was running for president, and Milton Berle played his manager, or whatever it was. And I was Milton Berle's girl Friday, his secretary. And that was it. <laughs> I want to talk about The Ladies' Man, but before we talk about that, can you talk about the pilot you did called Permanent Waves? That was a pilot that Jerry Lewis produced. That was right after I did The Apartment. Mel Brooks talked him into it, said, you got to use Hope Holiday. 
Watch her in the apartment. You'll love her. So he tested me. Or he he was pretending that he was rehearsing a screen test for me. That's when Mel Brooks was really getting started, just about getting started, and he was working for Jerry Lewis. And he was sitting there kind of like half directing it. And uh, I thought, you know, we were doing a test, but we weren't. We were actually doing the test. So I really played it up, and I got it. My best friend, Beverly Wills, who played my sidekick on it. We both played Lady Barbers in the Waves. And Kathy Freeman in it, she was it was in it. She she did all the Jerry Lewis movies, or a lot of them. Uh, she played the general in it, or whatever you want to call her. Not a general, what would she be? An admiral, something like that. We just did it, and Jerry tried to make a, a Jerry Lewis out of me. I'm not Jerry Lewis. I'm nothing like Jerry Lewis. What was the, do you remember what the plot of that pilot was? what the idea of it was? Barely. Barely. I know I had a boyfriend in it. And, uh, no, no, you know something? That was three million years ago. I barely remember it. I just remember running around doing everything ass backwards and wrong. You know, I never got anything right. And he tried to make me act like Jerry Lewis and walk like I was, like I couldn't walk. I don't want to say crippled, but that's what he, the way he the way he made me walk. He wasn't exactly the nicest man in the world. I couldn't stand him. This was Mel Bro This was Mel Brooks or Jerry Lewis. No, well, either one of them. Mel Brooks was married to my best girlfriend Florence Baum, and uh, he wasn't exactly great to her. So she divorced him. She had three children with him. She divorced him. No, it was actually Jerry Lewis who wanted me to be a female Jerry Lewis. I'm not a female Jerry Lewis. I can't do that kind of comedy. That sticky comedy, knocking things over, breaking glasses, tripping and falling. I don't do that. When he asked you to be in The Ladies' Man, were you apprehensive at that point? Well, I wasn't thrilled. He invited me into his dressing room to discuss the part. And he locked me in. He wouldn't let me out. I said, my boyfriend is waiting for me at the gate. He's going to drive me home. I don't know how to drive a car. I said, please let me out. He did. He ended up letting me out. And the next morning, I went into my dressing room. I, I already was in the, I already had the movie. I went into my dressing room, and there's a book. And it says, you're better than you think. It was on my dressing table. And I'm saying, what is that? And he wrote this whole big, long message in there saying, I have no confidence in myself. Well, that book was enough to take all my confidence away. That That's what Jerry Lewis did to me. And a couple of other things that I can't talk about because it wouldn't be nice. He was crude, and he was a, a womanizer, and I hated him. That's it. I had a scene where I had to beat him up. Did you enjoy that? Yes, and I did. And if you ever see the movie and you see where I hit him and I beat him up, I really did. Yeah, you did. I watched it. Yeah, I, I really slapped the hell out of him. And uh, he went to his dressing room, and he sulked. Then he came back and we finished the scene later, about an hour later. He was not a nice man. You know, he used to talk badly to people who were, he felt were beneath him, like some guy that worked on the set. He put him in a high chair, put one of the guys in a high chair, and then took that whipped cream that you squeeze out of a can. Mm hmm and he squeezed and he shot it all over his face, his hair, his clothes. I didn't think that was funny. And he, they took a picture of it and they put it outside the commissary. They thought it was funny. I mean, it's not my sense of humor. I don't know, maybe I'm bizarre. I don't know. Did you enjoy any of your other cast members that you worked with on that movie? Uh, Karen Cupson at Beverly Wills. 
was my best friend. I just wrote a book about her and about her death. She burned to death in her house in Palm Springs with her two little boys. They were little. One was about four and the other was about six and her grandmother. And uh, I wasn't down there that weekend, thank God. But they all burned to death. They weren't recognizable. God. And nothing burned except that one room. That room blew up and the rest of the house was intact. Figure that out. I remember all the girls in it, most of them. Do you want to talk about the apartment? I'm. Would that have been a happier story in terms of director? Because you've talked very highly about Billy yes. Wilder. Do you th talk about Billy Wilder as a director? He's the best director I have ever worked with in my life. He really is. He's the finest. He was the finest director. He's the only director that ever directed me. If you look at the um, Blu-ray edition of the apartment, I shot this uh, documentary. Um, last year, last uh, probably last January or so, and then it came out like around in uh, May. If you get a hold of it and you can see it on Blu-ray, it's uh, Letter to Castro. A lot of people talk in it, and it's quite interesting. They show the movie, but then a lot of people talk about Billy Wilder, and they talk about Izzy Diamond, and they talk about everybody in it. Shirley McLean is in it. She talks a lot about Billy, but I have one big scene where I talk about him and I talk about working with him and honest to, honest to God, I started to cry. I'm going to cry now too. It just it was so touching because he was the only director I've ever worked with that ever, ever directed me. Usually it's all in the in the documentary, but usually a director will say, uh, okay, Hope, uh, we're ready to shoot. Okay, let's go, action. And you do your scene. They don't tell you anything. They You were hurting, they say nothing to you. And they say, oh, fine, that's a print. Or they say, we'll shoot it one more time. Billy Wilder rehearsed the bar scene part with me. We rehearsed that, Jack, Billy, and myself. And Billy said to me, Hope, when you blow the straws at, at Jack Lemon, when you pick him up in the bar, don't look at the straws. Look at it once. You know where the straws are? Just take a straw. And just keep looking at Jack, stare at Jack, tear the end of the straw off and blow it at him. Then take another straw, blow it at him, and react to what you do. And I did everything he told me to do. And I thought to myself, oh, isn't this going to be boring? It turned out to be really good. And not because of me, but because of Billy's direction. And then when we get to the bar itself, when I pick him up at the bar, I say, uh, you buy me a drink, I'll buy you a little music. And he says, uh, give me two more of these mothers or something like that. And I go, I go to, I play a song and I come back and Billy says, said to me, the both of you, Hope and Jack, Never look at yourselves. Never look at each other in the scene. Never, ever look at each other. Look straight ahead across the bar into the mirror on the other side of the bar and just look straight ahead and say your lines. And it was very effective. I believe Robert Osborne said it was the best scene in the movie. I thought it was, too. It was really, it was really a good scene. And Jack was so wonderful. He was a great guy. He was wonderful to work with. And he relaxed me. He made me feel very relaxed. At one point, when we were rehearsing, this is before Billy really directed the scene, we were at the bar, and we just ran through the scene, the dialogue. And at the end of it, he said to me, Hope, he said, 
stop making those faces. He said, you're screwing your face up and you're making faces. He said, you look ugly. He said, you look like Fanny Bryce. I never forgot that. I thought it was insulting to Fanny Bryce, but it was kind of funny when he said it. So I didn't say anything. I just did what he told me to do. I did everything he told me to do. And there was at the end of the scene when Jack kicks me out, he pulls me at a funny angle and he pulled my hair and it was standing straight up in the air on one side. I looked so funny. It was just an accident, but it turned out great. And then when he says to me, uh, here, here's some money, go call your husband in Havana. Well, when he pulled me up off the sofa, I didn't have my shoes on. And I slipped on the floor with because I had stockings on and I was on linoleum. I slipped and I almost broke my neck. They kept it all in the scene. They didn't cut it and say, we'll reshoot it. And uh, we just finished the scene. He said, call your husband in Havana and uh, or something like that. And I said, you bet I will. And when I tell him how you treat him, he'll push your face and you think. That was the end of the scene. He slams the door on my face. Do you think that that was the best take of the scene to do that, to leave in the scene where he almost, where you almost hurt yourself? Yes, because it's lucky that I didn't hurt myself. It, it just turned out right. If you look at that part again, you'll see where I slip and almost go up in the air. And you can see where when he pulls me up, my hair, he got me by the hair or something, and my hair is standing straight up in the air. It happened to turn out, turn out good. So they just left it in. I would have done it if I was the director because it's something that just happens and it just happens to be right for the part and for the scene. Were you happy to work with him again in Irma LaDouche? Uh, yeah, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> he said, oh, he said to me when I said my first line in the, in the movie, he said to me, oh, this is not a Brooklyn Jewish hooker from, this is, it's not a, 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 yeah, a Brooklyn Jewish hooker. He said, speak in your own voice. I said, oh, okay. And I did. Oh, no, when he, when he didn't like something, he let you have it, and he let you know it, too. You brought up your, your voice. Was that something that you had developed, uh, the specific no. style talking? Was that just how you naturally talked? No, that's the way I naturally talk. That's why my mother gave me elocution lessons. She didn't want me talking like that. It was awful. As much as I love your voice, did that ever affect, you know, getting a role? Did someone, did you ever have a situation where you said, well, she would work the part, but, you know, her voice doesn't work. Did anything like that ever happen in your career? No, no, never. A lot of times I spoke in my own voice, too. It was fun. What was it like working at Paramount at that time? It was wonderful. It was the best studio I ever worked at. That and Goldwyn. They were my two favorite studios. They were wonderful to us at Paramount. They really were. They treated us like queens. Every morning I would get made up. They were shooting breakfast at Tiffany's at the same time when I worked with uh, Jerry Lewis. And uh, Audrey Hepburn and I would get made up at the same time. And we'd talk every morning. She was a doll, an absolute doll. She was so nice. And, of course, I had a big crush on Jack, uh, George Papard. We dated a little bit, but that disappeared. I want to ask you about the rounders. That was when, oh, I had the best time of my life. That was the most fun. I loved Henry Fonda. He is the nicest. He was the nicest, sweetest guy. And he got the biggest kick out of me. I don't know why he liked me. He used to say, what, what did he say to me? He used to say, you just tickle me plumb to death. Because that was one of his lines in the movie. With In the scene we were in, tick, you tickle me plumb to death to uh, uh, Glenn Ford. And he used to turn to me. He used to say that all the time. He'd laugh at everything I did. And then we used to have dinner at night. We were just buddies. We'd have dinner at night. We we go to this dumpy place called the Turtle up in Sedona, Arizona, and uh, we'd all hang out. 
And then we had a problem with in the in the movie with Chill Wills, Edgar Buchanan, and Denver Pyle. They used to get drunk every night and start fights. They'd start fights in the bars. So the director and producer got together and they said, you know what? Let's shoot all their their stuff now and get rid of them and send them back to L.A. And they did. So we had like a vacation for a week up there. We just had fun. We had um, Glenn Ford's son was up there and uh, Henry Fonda's son was up there. They were just visiting and hanging out. And we all had a lot of fun. And it was great working with them. The only person that annoyed me was Sue Ann Langdon because she had all the the, the long speeches and I had the punchlines. So what was I to do while she's just chatting away and I'm waiting to say my punchline? So I started mugging and making faces. <laughs> I never should have done it. I did it. Most of my friends said, why did you make those awful faces? I said, because I was trying to save my ass. That's why. But maybe it worked in reverse. I don't know. Disobedience in Broadway coming back to haunt you? Yes, disobedience in Broadway. I didn't, I didn't use any accents or anything. Oh, when I was doing uh, Little Abner, uh, and I'd go on for Mammy Yoakum when she was out sick. Every time I'd go on, I went on quite a bit. And I'd sit in the back, they turned and had a revolving stage. So the first scene was going on in the beginning of the second act. And I was in the back with Pappy Oakham. And he said to me, first of all, I hated playing the part. He said to me, just think one of these days you're going to be playing this part in summer stock. I said, no way, Jose. I'll never play this part again. I hate it. And I didn't. The woman who played it, who who was wonderful, was Billy Hayes. She didn't originate it, but she was great. Charlotte Ray originated it. She was good, but Billy was great. We're still friends. She lives up the street from me here in my place in Hollywood. So I always see Billy and her friend. We go to dinner, and we're still friends. That's nice to hear. That's three million years ago that we did that show, but... We're still buddies. Friendships last a lifetime. That's good to know. Yeah, it is. And our best friend, Dickie Lerner, who was in Little Abner with us, he was in the movie with us, and then we became all became very close friends. He died a couple of years ago, and it just broke my heart because he was my best friend. When I produced my first schlock movie, uh, I didn't have enough money and David Winters, who was the director and producer also, I was the producer too, didn't have any money. So I went to my husband. I said, we have the below the line money. We were shooting in South Africa. I said, but we weren't able to get our papers discounted because they had apartheid in South Africa. So they had sanctions. There was no way we could get a bank to discount the paper from Vestron Video. My husband said, can I help you? I said, yes, could you give me $75,000? And in those days, this is 1986, we didn't have any money. You know, we had a couple of bucks. We didn't have anything. And then I went to my mother, and I said, Mom, could you give me some money? I'll give it back to you. You'll have it back probably in a couple of weeks, as soon as our paper gets discounted. Well, it didn't get discounted here or anywhere. And Dickie Lerner, my other best my best friend, my mom, my best friend, and my husband. They all gave me money, and we ended up paying everybody the first week's salary. I paid all the air, airfares over there, and I helped out as much as I could financially, you know, to a point. And uh, I got my money back because the man who had the bond on the film went to Australia, and he got the, he got the papers discounted. So we got our money. And was that Space and Mutiny? Go ahead. That, that, no, that wasn't Space Mutiny. That, that was the last film we did. That was the last, and it's considered the second worst film ever made. 
We'll get talk. And that's the truth. We'll talk about that more uh, in a minute. I was wondering if I could ask you, jumping back a little bit, do you remember the episode of That Girl? Yeah, you did with Marlo Thomas. And- oh, sure. Of course, I remember it with Jack Cassidy. Oh, we had a ball. We had fun. That's when uh, we, uh, Marlo and I became good friends. And was it actually sh- shot in Vegas? Yes, it was shot at the uh, was it the Sahara? I think it was the Sahara Hotel. We had a ball, and Jack Cassidy was a character. He's we're in the we're in the uh, we're down in the casino shooting a scene. And he says to me, oh, I've got some time to kill. He said, do you have any money on your holiday? I said, yeah, I've got $100. He said, give it to me. I'm going to play for both of us. And like a stupid idiot, I gave him the $100. (laughs) And then after the scene, I said, how did we do? He said, we lost. I said, oh, then that night I see him gambling in the casino. I said, how you doing? Great. I'm doing great. I said, well, what about our money? Why don't you pay me back the money you borrowed or give me half of it? He said, no, that, he said, that was your money. He said, I'm playing with my money now. I never forgot that. He was a character. He was a character, but he was fun. He was fun to work with. And we all worked very well in it. We did well. It was a cute show. It was a two-parter. It was very cute. Do you remember the Love American Style episode you did? Yes, of course I do. I love that, and I loved Kenny Mars. Kenny Mars was a funny man. He was a wonderful man, and he was a funny man. He played my husband, and I played the cheating wife, and Sandy Barron played the neighbor next door, the schnook. And I was cheating on my husband, and I end up hiding in the closet my husband's after me, and I'm in the closet of Sandy Barron's house. In Sandy Barron's house, and then my boyfriend comes in, Jack Riley. He just passed away recently. Jack was in it, and the two of us are hiding in the closet. And then my husband comes in, who's Kenny Mars, and he said, "Have you seen Delilah?" And and uh, Sandy Barron said, "No, no, no. I haven't seen her. I haven't seen her." He said, I have a feeling she's around here somewhere. Well, I was in the closet right next to where he was standing. So then he pulls open the closet door, and he sees, uh, I'm hiding behind clothes, and he sees Jack Riley. He says, what are you doing here? He said, I'm looking for a new new coat. And he, he had a coat in his hand. Then the next thing, he yanks him out, and I'm standing behind him. He says, Now I got you. Now I got you. He said, off to Scotland Yard. He was a cop, by the way. He was a policeman. It was cute. It was a cute show. We had fun. And that was directed by Alan Rafkin? Yes, Al Rafkin directed it. He's gone. Kenny's gone. Uh, Sandy Barron's gone. Oh, God. Jack Cassidy's gone. There's so many people. I look at pictures stills that I have of myself in different movies and I'm saying oh gee I'm the only one that's here so far they're all gone anyway I hope I stick around for a while I hope you do too you're a funny lovely lady well I certainly work hard at trying to stay healthy when did you meet Cameron Mitchell I knew you were going to say that I met him in the in a movie I did about Howard Hughes, the Howard Hughes story. I don't know whatever happened to it. It's in with my credits. It's on the IMDb. I don't know. I met him in 1978 or 9, around there. What do you know about Cameron Mitchell? Uh, he was a prominent actor in westerns and did a lot of TV work, and I am obviously prominently know him of the movies that... Uh, he was very popular in Europe. I'm guessing he was a big bill around the time there. Yeah. He was also a degenerate gambler. He couldn't stay away from the horses. I would go to the track with him sometime, and I swear to God, before the races start, started, a man would come over the speaker. He'd say, 
Would Cameron Mitchell please report to the manager's desk? Please come to the manager's desk. You have a show that starts tomorrow. They were trying to get in touch with you. Oh, that was awful. That was funny, though. Yeah, they knew, always knew where to find him at the racetrack. I did a, I, I did a bunch of movies with him, and I worked a lot with him. Oh, that was last reunion, the first, or Texas Lightning, was that the first one you did with him? Not, I was the first one that you did. No, raised. no, the Howard, the, the Howard Hughes story was the first movie I did. Texas Lightning, our friend, a mutual friend, directed, and he was the uh, cinematographer, Gary Graver. He just did something that they sent us a copy of about Orson Welles. He did Orson Welles' picture. It was so boring. You have no idea. I couldn't even sit through it. Cameron was in it. And, uh, of course, Gary was a very good friend of mine. He's gone. He died young. No, I was going to say, working with Cameron Mitchell was certainly an experience, I can tell you that. He wouldn't do anything. Any If they wanted him to do something, he didn't want to do it. He wouldn't do it. And they'd all come to me. They'd say, Hope, make him do it. Make him do it. And I'd say, you better do that or I'm going to see that you're fired and they're going to send you back to America. This is over in the Philippines. He said, nobody's going to send me back. And he, oh, and he said, do you know who I am? I said, yes, I know who you are, Cameron Mitchell. He said, I was in Death of a Salesman. I said, that was 300 years ago. Nobody remembers. Oh, I was, it was terrible. We were buddies. We were good buddies. What did you like about him? He was adorable. He was charming. He was funny. He was like a big teddy bear. And everybody loved him. He was just fun to be with on the set until he started telling his stories in coffee shops, you know, like when we were in Australia or when we were in uh, the Philippines or South Africa. I did almost all the movies that he did at the end. They were all schlocky movies, and some of them were my movies that I produced. And he was not great in them. That one movie, Codename Vengeance, I don't know if I had told you this before, where he gets killed and he's supposed to fall over and die. He just keeps walking and he's talking and making dialogue up. He's saying, bury me at the wherever, bury me at the, at the, at the racetrack, bury me at the racetrack. You'll always remember me. You won't remember my parts, but you'll remember my grave. And I kept saying, oh, my God, to myself, what am I going to do? And David Winter said, cut. David said, Cameron, you get shot and you die. That was 10 minutes ago. You're still talking and walking. He said, die. So he said, okay, we'll start again. Let's shoot the scene. We start the scene again, and he does the same bloody thing, talking and talking and talking and talking. He was impossible. So David Winters, who directed it, just looked at me and said, what can I do? I said, let him finish the scene, and when he gets shot, just cut it, and that'll be the end. They'll think he died. He fell over and died. So that's what we did. He was impossible at times, but he was fun. When you were associate producer on those films, what were your roles? I wasn't associate producer on the films. One film, I, no, two films. I was associate producer on Low Blow and uh, I, Kill Point. It was Kill Point, Kill Point, Kill Point. Yes, on that Low Blow and Kill Point, Leo Fong's movies. I was also in them. And then after that, when they wanted Cameron for movies, I said, you want Cameron Mitchell? I have to be producer because he won't, he'll be impossible to work with unless I control him. So that's how I became a producer. Was wrangling Cameron Mitchell your only real job as producer? Or did you have other responsibilities when you were working on those films? No, 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 no. I, I had some good roles in the, in the pictures. I did. The one uh, I shot in the Philippines, Raw Force, 
I had a I, I had the lead in it really. It was about a ship that was going to this warrior's island where they, it was horrible, where they uh, they had zombies and they had these weird priests and the zombies ate human flesh. Human uh, girls, they would barbecue them and they would baste them and then, <laughs> then they would roast them or whatever they did and then they would eat them and then they would regain their strength again and become human for a night. It was a terrible picture. I had the lead in that. And Cameron had the second lead in that. Were you happy producing at that point in your career, or would you have preferred just to act? At that point in my career, I liked both. I enjoyed producing. I really did. But I was happier acting, really, because I could have fun. And when you became an executive producer, did that did your roles change at that point when you were working on projects? Code name Vengeance. I was executive producer. I raised the money for it, and I own the I own the rights to it. Rage to Kill. I own. I own Space Mutiny, Return to Justice, and the others I don't own. Low Blow and the rest. Okay, of I want to ask about Space Mutiny, if that's okay with you. I know you said that. Okay, sure. Which... It's the worst movie ever made. It's the worst movie, schlockiest movie ever made. But it's so bad that it's campy. It's campy. It's funny. Sure, you see a guy in the scene fly over. Uh, he falls over a balcony, and he gets killed, falls flat onto the floor, like 100 feet, 50 feet, I don't whatever. He's dead. The next scene... He's in the next scene doing another kind of a part. I mean, it was like a joke. The film w was it apparent while it was being made that it was a, that it was going in that direction, or was this something that where it wasn't till you had the no. To me, it was okay. To me, it was. To me, it was. David Winters. He said he directed the film. He shouldn't have said he directed the film because it was rotten, but it was funny. It was so bad, it was funny. It really was. That's why uh, this, uh, I can't think of the, the name of the program where these guys show these oh, Mystery Science Theater? Movies. Yes, yes. Mystery Science Theater, that was their big hit. Were you happy with it being made fun of on that show? Oh, I laughed all the way to the bank. You know, I don't care. I didn't care. Sure, I'd love to do a great movie. And I hope the movie that I, I wrote about Beverly Wills and Joan, she was Joan Davis's daughter, who had a show called I, Lo I Married Joan or something like that in the 50s. That, that is something that I'm going to be proud of because that's a good movie. It's a good script and it's a good movie. And it's written by my friend, Sharon Michaels, who's a very talented writer. She wrote it on the, on, wrote it without taking any money. And she will get paid when the movie goes, and it's going to go soon. Are you hoping to get that as a production? As, as a, or would you be listed as producer as well on it, or would you just be? Uh... Uh, no, I'm going to be the producer, and I'm also I'm not going to be in it. But my name, Hope Holiday, is going to be in it. Me as a person, who the person that I was, will be in it because that was very important in Beverly. Someone life. will be playing you in the movie. Okay. Yes, yes, somebody will be playing me young mm -hmm. when I was young. I look forward to it. I I look forward to it, too, and I've been working very hard on it. And I hope everything turns out the way I expected it to. Did you, uh, with Space Mutiny, I want to ask, did you enjoy working with John Philip Law? Or did you have any? Uh, he's, oh, he was nice. He was a nice guy. He didn't have much personality or anything and you know he wasn't fun to be with but you know, he was nice he wasn't very good but he was nice I don't know why I picked him for the movie I did the casting I picked him because I thought he was cute <laughs> I think God knows why God knows why and Red Brown and uh, Sissy, Red Brown Sissy Cameron they ended up getting married from that movie no, he was already married oh, okay. to her.
and she was older than him, Sissy Cameron. She was a, a character. And you did um, the last movie you produced was called. I'm going to get the title up. Return to Justice. Were you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was the worst. That was that was worse than Space Mutiny. In terms of producing it, or in terms of just the final product was worse. And final, the final product, it was terrible. And I really, even though I put the whole deal together and everything, and I got the script, it just didn't work. It was terrible terrible movie and the woman that I had hired who was my best friend Debbie Nethersoul uh, produced it I was the executive producer I mean, there wouldn't have been a movie without me because I got the whole thing started and put up the seed money and uh, then this other guy Larry Hirsch who now lives in Australia uh, left. he left South Africa uh, he took the movie God knows where it is now. It's probably in his toilet. I don't he know. He has the actual print of the movie. The actual... Uh, he may. He may. I don't know. I haven't seen him in years. I don't know. It was a terrible movie. And my friend, my buddy was in it. Rich Lynch? It. Yeah, Richard Lynch. Rest in peace. He's yeah. gone, too. Yeah. He was a nice guy. He lived near us in the desert. So my husband and I saw a lot of him. We'd hang out together. And did you choose to stop producing at that point? I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to work anymore. I didn't feel like it. I just didn't feel like it. I was busy concentrating on my husband's acting career and helping him. And uh, I happened to be an interior decorator, believe it or not. Then I got tired of it. Yes, I liked it, but I got tired of it uh, for a while. The while was like a year. I got bored with it. It's, it wasn't my thing. I do, and I'm not bragging, I do have good taste, and I am a good decorator, but I just don't want to do it. I decorated my place in the desert, which is very pretty. It's beautiful in the desert. It's all African. Everything came from Africa. Every time I go to Africa... I always get something and bring something back, or somebody gives me something. And I, everything is African in my house, and I love it. I was just going to say, can you talk about Seth Kitte? He's a doll. He's one of my good friends. He's one of my best friends. He's a doll, and he did all the movies, handled all the movies that we did. And uh, he made me some very nice money. What advice would you have for someone who wanted to become a motion picture producer or actor? Let's start with producer. What advice would you have for someone who wanted to become a producer? I don't know. They would have to really want to be a producer. They would have to know something about production. They would have to study. They would have to learn. And they would have to know scripts. You get a good script and you're a producer. You really don't have to know anything, actually. You get a good script, and that's it. Um, you know, what, what, what do you think makes your career, what is your happiest moment from your career? What do you think was the greatest aspect of your career professionally in Hollywood? In Hollywood? Or Broadway? Well, Broadway is another thing. Hollywood is my life. Uh, it has to be the apartment. It has to be the premiere of the apartment when we went to Romanoff's. And I and Billy said, you're invited to the premiere, he said, and to the party at Romanoff's afterward. And I thanked him. And I went. I took a date with me, just somebody that I knew. And uh, Billy took me over to the table to, with Marilyn Monroe and Eve, Eve Montan. And he got up and he kissed my hand and he said, wonderful woman. I was going, oh, 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 oh. I didn't even know what to say. I said, thank you very much. And another time, everybody at the party was wonderful, except uh, Fred McMurray, who didn't know who the hell I was, didn't even know I was in the film. He's a, He was on uh, in Cloud 7. He's in another world. He was a really strange man. He used to bring his lunch to the, th to the uh, theater. To the uh, to the studio every day to the set, he would eat in his dressing room. He was an oddball. 
Well, I think we've wound down. I just want to say, um, you know, thank you for taking the time to talk to me, talk to uh, some nerd in Kansas about your life. Yeah, and uh, you're not a nerd in Kansas. What the hell is that? Let the record show you were in a Academy Award-winning movie, and any credit you've ever gotten in your life is 100% deserved. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You are very sweet, and I appreciate it.